Hello. Um, my name is Carl Daniel Heilfinger. I'm one of the developers of the Corboot project. And I'm very happy to be here today at FOSDEM and to have the chance to present um, something about Corboot, especially one of the most asked questions today. Now, we had a slight glitch in that um, yesterday evening while trying to film a demo uh, or to document how the hardware works just in case something goes wrong. Um, the demo hardware died. I still have the video and we will um, try to show something, but you might not see that much if I just hold up that laptop. It's a bit small for people to see um, at the higher rows here. So, yeah, um, let me just start. Um, what is Core Boot? Core Boot is an x86 BIOS EFI replacement, not a BIOS or EFI. Um, let me just elaborate a bit on that. Um, some, I think 11 years ago, Core, the Core Boot project was founded, um, and back then it was called Linux BIOS because the original idea was, well, nothing besides BIOS existed back then, and the idea was, hey, just stuff Linux in the ROM and let it do all the stuff a BIOS would do. However, um, that name has come, the name Linux BIOS has come to haunt us in a way which was unexpected. People said, well, I don't want a BIOS, I want EFI, and I don't want Linux, I want Windows. And given that Core Boot has nothing to do with um, a BIOS and it has nothing to do with Linux, we decided to rename the project to actually reflect what it does, Core Boot. It's the essential stripped down core of what you need to boot a machine. So our principles are fast, simple, secure, and free. Now that may sort of remind you of other projects um, that's an accident. <laughs> um, the idea between, um, behind uh, fast, simple, and secure, and free is we want to provide a solution which we can maintain easily, which you have benefits of, and which is um, the optimal solution for pretty much everything you could throw at it, at least in the x86 space. So the idea was just perform minimal hardware in it and then pass control to the operating system. Now, maybe just uh, to find out how much people in this uh, room know about um, uh, x86 computer initialization, who doesn't know exactly what a BIOS does? Can you just please raise your hands? Okay, that's about half the audience. That's good. And, um, so let me just uh, start by saying what a BIOS is. A BIOS is essentially the code which gets run before any operating system is running. So you switch off your computer, switch on your computer, and the first thing the processor does when it gets power is it fetches the first few instructions. It fetches those instructions from a ROM chip. Well, traditionally it was a ROM chip. Nowadays it's a flash chip and executes those, those instructions. In that state, um, this an x86 computer has no RAM. It has no PCI output whatsoever. It has no access to floppy, to disk, to whatever. It's just the processor and the ROM, nothing else. So the idea is to switch on the stuff you, want, you actually want to use. Maybe your graphics card, your PCI bus. Um, maybe you want to use your RAM. It, well, you built it in, so you probably are interested in using it. And maybe you want to use your hard disk, stuff like that. So the BIOS or core boot or whatever initialization code you're using just initializes those devices. Now a BIOS not only initializes those devices, it also has drivers for disk, for floppy, for graphics card, etc. However, that code is assembler, which is not bad, but not easy to maintain. 
And the other problem is it's 16-bit assembler on a 64-bit machine. Well, you can't really blame the BIOS vendors. It's an industry which grew over time and it's tried and tested code back from 1982 or something like that, so they know it works. And if you switch on an x86 computer, it really starts up as a 16-bit machine. So each 64-bit machine starts up as a 16-bit machine with one megabyte of segmented address space and other fun stuff and uh, yeah. The H20 gate, if some people know what that is, but I'll skip that. Um, so the hardware simply doesn't work. And the first idea is you, all, you want to turn on RAM, then you want to initialize the PCI bus, you want to initialize graphics card, uh, storage controller, um, want to initialize uh, the stuff which is attached to the storage controller, for example, a hard disk. So. The first step to do anything useful is to enable RAM. But to enable RAM, you have to train the RAM. And um, if you don't have any RAM, you can't run C code. Because you don't have any stack, you can't do a malloc, you can't do anything. So BIOS vendors have traditionally just said, well, we'll use assembler, we'll use no call, just jump, 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 unroll all loops. Uh, the code is bloated, it's slow, but it works. Kurgut does it a bit different, and um, that's now just um, let me tell what Coreboot does. Coreboot, so when a machine is switched on, it executes the first instructions. And the first thing Coreboot does is enter protected mode to have 32-bit address space and to actually be able to run. Even on a 64-bit machine, we only enter 32-bit mode. This has reasons which I'll explain later, uh, among other speed. So the idea is go to protected mode, and then next step is switch on RAM. However, to switch on RAM, we have to execute some RAM training code. On x86, the RAM controller is pretty dumb, so you have to tell it everything. You have to take the measurements, take a look, um, have to analyze, uh, analyze eye diagrams and stuff like that. So what we do is we perform an old trick. Your CPU has um, cache. Not that much of it, uh, maybe 512 kilobytes or something like that. However, that cache works if you switch it on. So we switch on the cache, lock it, and say, well, please don't write through to memory, to real RAM. And then this cache can act as sort of RAM. And then we suddenly, once the cache is switched on and acts as RAM, that's what we call cache as RAM, you can execute C code and can really work with stuff. So first step, um, switch on the machine. Second step, enter protected mode. Third step, switch on cache as RAM. First step, train the RAM. So you get access to the RAM. And once you have RAM, you can, well, you have all the RAM in the machine you want, and then you can start initializing the PCI bus. The PCI bus is um, something which is essential to most x86 PCs. I don't think any x86 PCs without PCI bus are manufactured anymore. So where your graphics card is attached to, graphics, um, storage, uh, SATA, PATA, IDE controller, whatever. And once PCI bus in, is initialized, you have um, the ability to initialize uh, peripheral devices. For example, the storage controller, if you have a SATA controller, it wants to initialize the SATA link to the hard disk. So, well, simple is one thing, um, but um, it's less complicated than the BIOS because the BIOS also has to have drivers for everything to talk to that stuff. So minimal hardware in it is really all that stuff which I just mentioned. And then you pass control to an operating system or what we call a payload. 
So maybe let's just go back to what are the principles of core boot fast. Now people ask of, often ask why should I use core boot? Well, apparently from that we love to get more users. Um, there are real hard facts why initial uh, why using core boot is a good idea. Think of for example, um, what's the best um, problem people know? You switch on your computer and the bias starts up and takes a few seconds, maybe a few dozen seconds, or if you have a server, maybe two or three minutes to initialize the hardware and to give you the assurance and the feeling that it's really thorough in checking stuff. Well, um, there really is a sleep code in there to give you the impression it's um, doing stuff right. However, you as a user do not benefit from slow code. Um, well, the power plants may benefit from a longer runtime, but you do not benefit. So the idea is core boot is fast. On a normal x86 mainboard, core boot takes about half a second from power on to boot loader. Or if you stuff your kernel, your Linux kernel or Plan 9 kernel or whatever into the flash chip, it's half a second from power on to starting the kernel. On server boards, which are a bit slower and maybe where you have 64 gigabytes of RAM, this RAM needs to be initialized. That, so in those cases, uh, core boot may take maybe five to eight seconds instead of um, two or three minutes, so it's also a lot faster. Now, core boot um, is so fast that if you press the power button with your right hand and then you want to reach the keyboard before core boot is done initializing, you fail. It's not possible unless you have superhuman speed. Well, Superman could maybe do it, but uh, last I heard he's not human. Um, and then there's the aspect of simple. Core boot is written for maintainability and for usability. And with usability, I mean there is no user inter interface. So um, if there's no user interface, you don't have usability issues. Core boot is just there to initialize hardware. And then it should not mess with you. And it shouldn't ask you questions. It shouldn't display a pretty logo. It shouldn't display animations. Please wait while we initialize this device. If you see that, the software vendor has failed, totally failed. And um, you want to not notice at all that Core Boot is running. Core Boot is also simple, as I previously mentioned, we do not have drivers. Core Boot does not have disk drivers, does not have graphics drivers, doesn't have anything. Because what can you do in half a second? Display a message. Once the monitor has synchronized to your VGA signal, the, disp uh, the logo has already vanished, so it's pointless. Um, boot from disk is something which a payload does. Core boot just focuses on simple init. Core boot is also secure. Um, let's just focus on the second point I mentioned here with uh, auditable code. Governments do not trust anybody not their own citizens, and especially not other governments. So if a government says, well, we have some highly classified data, and we want to work with that data, they sometimes want real secure systems. Now, we all know that real secure systems are a bit hard to get. However, the next best thing is to have somebody audit the code. Now, if you buy a classic computer, you can't audit the code. You can go to the mainboard vendor and ask the mainboard vendor, please give us the source code to your BIOS. The mainboard vendor will tell you, well, we do not have it. The BIOS vendor has that code. Next, you get, go to the BIOS vendor, for example, Emmy Award or whatever, and ask them to give you the code. Maybe they do, maybe not. But even if they do give you the code, they will tell you, well, we do not have all the code. We just have some of the code and some hardware in it was provided by the chipset manufacturer or was provided by the 
um, processor manufacturer, we just got a binary blob. We do not have the code. Then you go to Intel, AMD, or whoever, and if you're lucky, they will give you some code. If you're unlucky, they will tell you to um, please come back if you want to buy a billion processors and stuff like that. And you usually do not have that budget, even if you're a government. So the idea is um, you want this code to be auditable, and if everything which runs on your processor is free and open code, the pro problem with audit is just the problem of finding somebody who is able to audit the code and finding somebody who is willing to do that for a cost which you can afford. But it's doable. And those persons auditing the code will scream in horror if you throw at them maybe a few 10,000 lines of assembler. That's the reason why we wrote everything in C, except, well, a dozen lines uh, switching on the cache and uh, switching on protected mode, and the rest is C code. So next aspect of why Corbett is secure is no code is running once the OS takes control. Um, who does know what SMM or system management mode is? Okay, short explanation. Um, the x86 uh, processors have a, um, a concept of privilege levels. So you have a ring three, which is basically um, the ring which operating systems use for user space. Ring three means lowest privileges. That stuff cannot mess, code running in ring three cannot mess with hardware. Um, code in ring zero, which is the classic lowest, uh, the, the highest privilege level, that's why it's lowest number. Um, this code can do everything with hardware, and that's what operating system kernels use. And then we have the ability to, in your Intel and AMD and other processors, to run system management mode code. This code can is at an even higher privilege level than ring zero. So you can use this system management mode to trap hardware accesses to emulate, for example, devices which do not exist. You can, for example, if you have an old operating system which can't handle USB keyboard, you tell your bias, please run some code in system management mode. And every time somebody presses a key on the USB keyboard, please emulate a PS2 port in software and um, let the OS, the operating system, think that the software which, uh, that there's actually a PS2 port and that there's a PS2 keyboard attached to it. So this system management mode code runs always. The OS can not stop it. The OS has no idea that this code is running. So, People have demonstrated rootkits in system management mode. It's real fun, and there's no way to detect, to, to detect that. And with core boot, we you don't use system management mode because, well, we have nothing to hide, and our code works well enough that we can do without system management mode. Uh, this also has um, benefits if you care about real-time latency because system management mode steals the processor from the OS and the OS doesn't know about it, so you get a horrible and unknown latencies. On the other hand, with core boot, that doesn't happen, so you get um, classic good latencies even on x86. Free, yeah, well, um, the source code is available for free under the new pa general public license version two, so you can do with it what you want, uh, um, well, if you conform to the license. Now, um, this is a diagram I really like because that's what a modern PC looks like. Um, I, do we have a laser pointer here? Um, we do not. Does anybody here in the audience have a laser pointer? Okay, great. Um, I'll just fetch it, sir. Thank you. So the idea of this simple modern PC is a classic PC is just 
as you know, it is just one CPU, one memory controller, RAM, and North Bridge. Uh, a South Bridge the North Bridge is mostly where um, in older machines memory was attached, and your machines, the PCI Express is attached. South Bridge hands PCI, USB IDE, and to South Bridge, the boot flash chip is attached. Now, modern PCs are a bit more complicated. If you have multiple processors, they all have their own memory controllers usually, have their own RAM attached. So initializing stuff is a bit complicated, um, but it works because, yeah, for example, if you want to initialize RAM, you have to read out the RAM configuration data. The RAM configuration data cannot be read directly by the CPU, can't be read by the North Bridge, can't be read directly by the South Bridge, but only by the SM bus controlling the South Bridge. So it's a bit complicated to initialize, but it works. Now on a laptop, it's a bit more complicated. You have a super IO or embedded controller chip, and that embedded controller chip handles thermal management. Um, it handles stuff like battery charging, like even switching on your machine. So um, this simple modern PC is um, fun. Now, um, This is uh, next slide is something I would wanted to skip. Well, um, so the idea now is um, to, I wish to apologize. Um, I had a slight hardware issue with uh, which caused me to lose some of my presentation. So I'll continue with audio only. Um, the architecture we saw of a laptop um, is if a slight, actually comes up again, yeah. Laptop architecture is, um, is that you have here an embedded controller instead of a super I.O. chip, and that embedded controller, as I mentioned, handles battery issues, et cetera, and you need to work with that as well. So um, about x86 in it, I already mentioned uh, that, so um, core boot is a bit, um, Strange, a strange beast in that um, people who say, well, what do I need to write core boot? Uh, how, how can I write a core boot support for my hardware? That's why many people came to this talk. And um, I really wanted to leave that point until, well, now. Um, the biggest problem when writing core boot support is that you need data sheets. And data sheets are hard to come by. Um, you can ask the vendors, and the vendors will give you data sheets, and the data sheets are just an overview of what the hardware does. It doesn't help you. Then some vendors give you a data sheet which has hardware programming information. For example, Intel do that, um, and AMG, AMD do that. That's nice, but uh, for core boot, we need um, data sheets which contain also information about initializing memory, about initializing the CPU, and stuff like that. And for modern consumer um, CPUs, modern consumer chipsets, it's very hard to get the documentation from Intel. It's pretty easy to get the documentation from AMD, which means it's downloadable for, on their website without registration. Um, and the question is, what can I do without documentation? Well, you can't do anything um, if you want to write chipset or processor code. The original question, how do I add support for my laptop, is answered by telling people, well, make sure your processor is supported by Core Boot. Make sure your chipset is supported by Core Boot. If your processor is not supported, you can either write um, um, support for your processor, well, that's a bit labor intensive, um, or you can switch, uh, or you can ask somebody, um, but that's the same problem, or you can ask the vendor nicely. Same for the chipset. However, if your chipset and your processor are supported, it is doable to add support for your laptop. Now, please don't run away screaming. 
Durable means that you can, if you have some hardware experience, uh, hardware um, knowledge, you can maybe get it done in a month uh, to a point where it works nicely. Um, however, if you, um, but that's only the case if you have data sheets and there's already working code for a CPU and chipset. If you don't have data sheets, I'd just suggest to give up because um, reverse engineering a chipset or a processor will take maybe two or three years if you work on it full time. It's not feasible. Um, however, reverse engineering parts of the laptop is, uh, or parts of your desktop main port is easier. Um, one of our developers, Sven Schnelle, who um, added support, uh, well, he's sitting there. Can you just stand up sh shortly? Because he supported the ThinkPad X60 and T60. Um, yeah. He um, worked with a logic analyzer and reverse engineered the ThinkPad. He was also lucky that um, he had schematics of the ThinkPad available so he could use it um, easily. So hardware debugging is something which you need. Such a complex beast uh, can be debugged um, best if you have a logic analyzer and you better have a good logic analyzer. And uh, yeah, I think I have a nice picture of what, of how our setup looked like. This was the, no, the was the wrong photo. No. Give me a second. We have, um, That's how it looks like <laughs> if you want to do that professionally. However, you can get by without that equipment. It's not that um, difficult to do. You can actually um, do it with a small $50 logic analyzer and some patience. Um, Writing getting back to writing support for your laptop. The idea of writing support for your laptop is um, you find out um, how your laptop works by running diagnostic tools like LSPCI, by checking the ACPI code of your uh, existing laptop, by um, running SuperIO tool, which is also one of the tools we wrote uh, for analysis of systems, uh, embedded controller checking, and stuff like that. And then you can just um, try to find out which command sequence means what, and then you can try to replay that stuff. Replay is something which works sometimes. Sometimes you better understand what you're doing, but it works pretty often. We have, um, if you do not own a logic analyzer, and those beasts are, well, expensive. Uh, a car is a lot cheaper. Um, so. What you can do is, we have a project which is called Serial Eyes. It's um, like a, a serial in-circuit emulator. So we use QEMU to run the x86 code and every hardware access is forwarded to the real hardware so you can just watch a BIOS execute and can just log everything it does and all you need is a serial cable for $5. Um, that's uh, a bit cheaper than a logic analyzer, but it's also slower than a logic analyzer. So, um, next on, um, what, um, right, um, and that's um, a partially disassembled laptop, which is actually running core boot, which is working, and no, don't fear, um, you can reassemble it later, and then it just looks normal. <laughs> Um, well, how many minutes do I have left? Three. Okay. So um, maybe I'll just um, that did not work totally as expected. Um, to demonstrate uh, how fast Core Boot boots, I have two options. First option, I show you that laptop. You will see something, maybe. Especially in the upper rows, it's hard to see anything. So the idea is to show a video of how it boots. 
um, you will see the key press uh, when Sven powers uh, this laptop on. And once the key press is done, the um, it needs Corbut needs about one second to start. And once you see messages on screen, Corbut is already done. So, okay, Corbut is done. Um, now I realize that a live demo is better, so I'll just um, um, well, if anybody can see it, I'm pressing the button now. And core boot is done. Um, well, I can't see the screen myself from the side, so um, <laughs> uh, maybe not the best option. Right. But uh, what I can demonstrate is um, we booted uh, to a full Linux system. I'll now reboot the system. It's shutting down and reboot now. Corbett is done, so it's fast. So yeah, if you want to write support for your laptop, um, just hit us up on our mailing list. Um, we'll tell you how to get started. Um, I hope this talk at least provides some uh, insight into how it could work. Now if you ask me which laptop can you buy right now, which is Corbett supported, the ThinkPad X60 and the ThinkPad T60 are well supported. They do work. They are only available on, um, well, auction sites and used. We are working on newer laptops. We're making progress with that. Um, I expect some new laptops, which are actually um, buyable in stores, to be supported in maybe middle this year, May or June. And then um, I hope everybody can enjoy a core boot laptop. Pardon? Oh, yeah. Uh, we are in the AW building. Um, so just um, if you have any questions, um, well, I'll take a few questions now. But um, for longer questions, please meet us at the AW building. And now I want to say thank you and questions, please. We've got a microphone over here and one over there for questions. So, Please come queue up. microphones are there and there. So, if it's possible to... Um, Could you please speak a bit louder? Yeah. If it's possible to uh, put core boot on a T60, um, can I use um, uh, your BIOS tool to write it? Um, yes, um, indeed. Um, the Corbett project has a few uh, other projects um, which belong to the Corbett family. There's Flash ROM, which allows you to write any BIOS, EFI, firmware, Corbett, whatever you want, to the Flash chip. And you can ref use Flash ROM to reflash um, the Flash chip of uh, a T60 or X60 laptop and get it working with Corbett. There's one limitation, you need some special, um, special utility to um, circumvent security, but it will work. Next question, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, does Core Boot uh, solve the problem that might occur when, uh, with, with, with Windows 8 and the UFI, uh, UEFI? Pardon? Does Core Boot solve the problem that might occur, occur with Windows 8? that requires to, uh, UEFI to be turned on? Um, well, um, the next, uh, you mean the Windows 8, which will require UEFI or what? Yes. Um, we haven't tested yet, but uh, Corbett does support uh, Tyana Core as a payload, so you can use Corbett for the hardware in it, and if you really need EFI, you could run with EFI if you want that. Pardon? Uh, a developer preview of Windows 8 has been booted with Corbett, so it does work, yes. Yeah? Uh, yes, so I have another question. It's a bit uh, linked to what he asked. How do you provide uh, all the features of uh, classical BIOS, like uh, booting on over PXE, USB, or uh, right. power management? 
Um, the point of Colbert is to have no drivers, so Colbert just quits at once uh, the init is done and then it can run, for example, um, a BIOS, um, well, a stripped down BIOS, for example, C BIOS, which we use for legacy support of Windows, Linux, and DOS. And that BIOS has drivers and then it can also boot from USB or whatever you want. Okay. Okay, one question there. Corboot seems to have many advantages. Could we please speak up a bit? Corboot seems to have plenty of advantages in uh, terms of speed and support. Why do the motherboard manufacturers not use it instead of carrying on buying BIOS chips? Um, the big problem with Corboot is that if you don't know something well, you won't trust it. So um, if a mainboard vendor says, well, I have a BIOS, I know it worked for the last 10 or 20 years, they will continue using a BIOS because for them, Colbert is an unknown risk. Even if you can demonstrate that it works well, it's an unknown or uncalculable risk. So we are seeing some mainboards vendors switch on demand, but it's slow. Thanks. I have okay. a question about uh, the graphics that you show of the typical modern PC. Yeah. Uh, do you provide on your website or in some open place some documentation about the modern PC uh, layout. For example, I'm thinking about a very well-known book, you know, probably the Mesmer book about PC hardware arch architecture. Yeah. yeah, we do have some, um, some information material, especially about uh, PC architecture. We do that, have that on our website. So um, I'll just ask you to visit our website at corebooch.org. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so thank you very much.